Chapter 11, The Frontiers of Despair, from the book Baffled to Fight Better by Oswald Chambers, dated 1917. Job's chapter 16 through chapter 17. Up till now, we have seen Job as the same pessimist, but now we find him on the frontiers of despair. It is impossible for him to go any further without getting into despair. A man may get to despair in 101 different ways, but when he gets there, there is no horizon. In everything else, there is hope that a dawn may come, but in despair, there is no hope of anything brighter. It is one of the dullest and most hopeless frontiers that a human mind can enter without becoming insane. An insane person is never despairing. He is either immensely melancholy or immensely exalted. Despair is the hopelessness that overtakes a sane mind when it is pushed to the extreme in grief. Number one, the revolt against pose. Job chapter 16 verses 1 through 5. In this chapter, Job is ironically taking on the pose that Eliphaz adopted, the pose of the superior person. Eliphaz scolded Job and said he was making much ado about nothing, that he was suffering because he was a bad man and a hypocrite. Job recognizes that Eliphaz does not begin to understand the problem that bothers him, and he is in revolt against pose. Pose is one of the most difficult things to evade in religious life. In the ordinary evangelical circles of today, it takes the nature of unconscious prickedness. For instance, if you have the idea that your duty is to catch other people, your whole attitude takes the guise of a prick. It puts you on a superior platform at once, and this is too often the pose of the earnest religious person of today. Of all the kinds of men one meets in civilized life, the minister takes the longest to get at for this very reason. You can get at a doctor or any professional man much more quickly than you can a man who is professionally religious. The religious pose is based not on relationship to God, but on adherency to a creed. Immediately I mistake God for a creed or Jesus Christ for a form of belief. I began to patronize what I do not understand. The pose of the Pharisees was exactly that with regard to Jesus Christ. When anyone is in pain, the thing that hurts more than anything else is pose. And it is that which Job is fighting against here. No one revolts against a thing without a reason for doing so, and it is not necessary a bad reason, for revolt is of a moral order. If we come across a counterfeit, the reality is sure to be found somewhere. Job is up against the religious pose of men who do not begin to understand where his sorrow lies. Number two, the recapitalization of pain. Job chapter 5, verse 6 through 22. Job's honesty and his freedom from cowardice come out very clearly. He would not say he was guilty of what he knew he was not guilty of. He says, I am not suffering because I have committed sin. I do not know why I am suffering, but I know that that is not the reason. The majority of folks would have caved in and said, oh well, I suppose I am worse than I thought I was. Atheism and revolt against God may not really be against God at all, but against the presentation being given of him. A. The psychology of it. Chapter 5, verse 6 through 8. There are many forms of grief with fine relief in expression, the garment of words expressing the thing. But Job says that he cannot get any assagement of his grief through the expression of it. God in his providence has worn out every one of his friends, and there is not one who can endure him. They believe he is desolate because God has left him. Every line of Job's experience psychologically seems to justify his friend's judgments. But at the same time, Job knows that this is not any explanation. B. The Providency of it. Job chapter 5 verses 9 through 15. This is the description in oriental terms 
of the providency of Job's pain. Everything that surrounds him in circumstances has come out against him. Job says, God seems to have engineered everything dead against me. The inward illustration of it and the outward are all the same. God has beset me behind and before like a wild beast. Everything in the provincial setting and the inner relationship goes to prove that my pain is the outcome of my sin. See the pathos of it. Job chapter 5 verses 16 through 22. This is not the pathos of a whining beggar who puts it on in order to awaken sympathy. Job's recount of his suffering is not the expression of self-conscious pathos. He is stating for his own sake that he is sane, that he is in despair, and so far as he can see, he is perfectly justified in being pessimistic. There are many things like this that are the outcome of the war, World War I, and we have to be careful that we do not take on the religious pose or the evangelical pose or the denominational pose or the pose that is not real. We come across suffering in which there is no illumination or deliverance. The only thing to do is to be reverent with what we cannot understand. The basis of things is tragic. Therefore, God must find the way out or there is no way out. Human reasoning and a human diagnosis of things will do exactly what Job's friends did. Viz, belittle the grief. Number three, the recognition of predestiny. Job chapter 17. If we look for understanding from a person and do not get it, the first feeling is one of revolt and indignation against him. Then when we begin to examine things, we find that after all, he is not to blame for his destiny. Everything at the back of life, at the back of his creed, goes to justify the decision he has come to. It is this element that increases the suffering of Job, whilst at the same time it clears the condemnation from himself. A. In the destiny of men. Job chapter 5, verses 1-4. through four. In grief, the sufferer often declares that no one on earth can assist him. Sometimes this is the pose of a grief-stricken man, but Job is seeing that his own destiny and that of his friends does not lie with them, but with the fact of predestiny. There are some kinds of suffering and temptation and sorrow with which no one can sympathize and in which a man gets on to a, the real solitary way of life. It is not the suffering of a man who has done wrong and knows it. It is in isolation in which no one can sympathize. God alone can come near Job's suffering. It is accounted for by the fact that God and Satan had made a battleground of his life, and he begins to discover now that it is God who has closed up the understanding of his friends. When we look for our friends to understand, and we find they do not, we accuse them of being dense. God has declared that Job will never get through and love God for himself. He will only love God for his blessings. And now, everything in the way of shelter and camaraderie and sympathy is completely stripped from Job. And he sees that God must have allowed it. This is the deepest line Job has come to yet. And he still clings to the fact that God is honorable. I have lost my family, my wealth, my friends, the consolation of my creed. I have lost everything to which a man can look at all for comfort. Yet, though he slay me, I will trust him. It is the supremest despair, along with the most extraordinary confidence in God, who, in the meantime, looks like a Moloch. B. In the discretion of men. Job chapter 5, verse 5 through 9. Job is recounting that his experience of sorrow and difficulty has so come about that the wise element of discretion in men must make them pass judgment against him. It seems that everything is against him, not only his creed, but the ordinary wisdom of men. There is nothing more astonishing, agonizing to a man in grief who knows his own integrity than to find out that the best people leave him alone, not because they do not know why he suffers, but because they are sure 
he is more in the wrong than he says. And that view is backed by their own discretion and knowledge. As in the case of the density of men, this discretion must not be laid at the door of men, but at the predestiny of the way human wisdom is fixed. The predestiny of human wisdom is rationalism. Any number of things happen which are not reasonable, and human discretion is apt to say that the man who suffers unreasonably is to blame. And when it is pointed out that the bias of the things is without reason, men say it is only a passing difference. God reveals that the basis of things is not reasonable but tragic. When a man is driven to the bottom of the world, he gets to the tragedy and not to the reason. He is alone with God, and if God does not see him through, despair is the only place for him. The more deeply and earnestly and directly a man thinks, the more he finds that what Solomon says is true. Increase of knowledge increases sorrow. It is not Job's humor that brings him to a pessimistic view, point of view, but his plain sanctity. He refuses to say that his pessimism is a mood. Optimism is a mood. If God does not see Job through, Satan has won his wager. If God does not come on the scene somewhere, it is a forlorn hope, and Satan will have proved that no one ever did love God for his own sake. Everything a man can rely on has disappeared, and yet Job does not curse God. He denies that the creeds are right or that his friends are right, but declares steadfastly that in the end God will be justified. See, in the despair before men, Job chapter 5, verses 10 through 19. Job cannot hide his despair for unfathomable pathos. Job chapter 5, verse 11. Is unequaled in any language under heaven. My days are past. My purposes are broken off. Even the possession of my heart. R.V. Margin. There is a type of religious hypocrisy where men hide what they are feeling. But Job has come to the place where he cannot hide it. He says, I cannot pretend that I am comforted of God. If only he could have taken on the pose that he had the comfort of God, his friends would not have challenged him. But he said, I have no comfort. I do not see him, nor can I talk to him. All I know is that our forms of belief and our creed must be wrong. I do not know what to accept, but I am certain that in the end God will prove that he is just and true and right, and I will not tell a lie in order to help him out. This attitude of religious faith is finally expressed by the psalmist. Then will I go unto God, my exceeding joy. Psalms 43 verse 4. This is the sublimest faith, the faith that Jesus Christ demanded of John the Baptist. Blessed is whosoever shall not be offended in me. Matthew chapter 11 verse 6. Will I stick to it without any pretense or humbug that God is right, although everything in my actual experience seems to prove that he is wrong. The majority of us are hypocritical. We are too afraid to state the thing as Job stated it. We say right out, Because I am going through this, therefore God is cruel, and I refuse to believe in him anymore. Job stuck to his point that when everything was known, it would not be to God's dishonor, but to his honor. Through this war, a great number of men, World War I, in lesser degree, have arrived at the place where Job was. Their creed about God is gone, and it would be the height of absurdity to pretend that their former beliefs of God are true, as they see him now. Because a man has lost belief in his beliefs, it does not follow that he has lost faith in God. Many a man has been led to the frontiers of despair by being told that he has backslidden, whereas what he has gone through has revealed to him that his belief in his beliefs are not God. Men have found God by going through hell, and it is the men who have been face to face with these things who can understand what Job went through. All the impatience and irritations against so-called religious life is accounted for on the same lines as Job's revolt against religious posts. If they would only stop their posts and face facts as they are, and to be reverent 
with what they do not understand and assist me in my faith in God. Job's friends were in the right place when they sat with him dumbfounded for seven days. They were much nearer God than they afterwards. Immediately they took up the cordials for God. They took on the religious posts. They lost touch with the reality of the actual experience and ended in being bombastic. End of chapter 11.